Hi, Katie. Hi, Olivia. We're back. We're back. Yeah, It was a good break. It was a good break. It actually feels really long. You went to Greece. I did. I was there for five, six weeks. I went nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> I ate so much Greek salad literally every day. Yay. So That's good. my dream. So good. So yeah, in this do. coming season, obviously, I'll have some Greek-themed episodes in the docket. Exciting. And I'm heading to Scotland next month, cool. so I'll have some Scottish themed Ooh, I for hope us. so. Very cool. But today, we are going to talk about the person who invented some of the most important psychological theories of our time. Oh. Huh. For example... We're going to talk about the person who came up with the idea of the death wish. Whoa, really? And the person who came up with the idea of ancestral memory. Oh, interesting. As in, like, you carry the memories of your ancestors? Exactly, that you are walking around mm. carrying buried memories mm. from your actual ancestors. Mm. Says the woman who's about to go to Scotland. Yeah. The land of her ancestors. Exactly. Cool. Okay, so I associate these ideas with, like, Freudian, Jungian psychology. Mm. But, of course, Freud and Jung, they're men. <gasps> they so, are. are you about to tell me that a woman came up with those and the men got all the credit? <laughs> I am about to tell you that. <gasps> that is shocking. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Somehow, somehow I am persistently surprised. Yeah, it, I mean... Every single time, I think, but yeah, how, but surely, yeah. And in this episode, I think we're going to encounter a new form of erasure, hmm. a new method of erasure that we haven't talked about yet. Okay. Huh. I'm Olivia Mickle. And I'm Katie Nelson. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating Women You've Never Heard Of. First, let's meet who we're talking about. Her name is Sabina Spielrein, and she is best known for being one of Jung's patients <laughs> and possibly his mistress. Classic. And that is all anyone knows about yeah. her. Okay. But there's so much more to Sabina Spielrein yeah. than a possible affair yeah. and a childhood mental illness. So to learn more about her, I talked to you, Dr. Angela Sells. Hi, my name is Dr. Angela Sells. I am a women's studies professor in Seattle. I am the author of Sabina Spielrein, The Woman and the Myth, published by SUNY Press last year in paperback. I am a drummer in the band Below Black Star and fight for women's rights, especially female musicians' rights, as an editor for TomTom Tom Magazine. Dr. Sells wrote a biography of Sabina Spielrein by far the best biography, and the only one that, in my opinion, gives anything close to an accurate picture of who she was and what she means hmm. to modern psychology and philosophy. Sabina Spielrein was a psychoanalyst, one of the first female uh, pioneers. She's often presented as the mistress, so-called mistress of Carl Jung, and is presented via the 2011 movie with Kara Knightley, Dangerous Method, as some sort of pawn in a love affair between Jung and colleague Freud in 1909 in Switzerland, in Zurich. But actually, even though she had been diagnosed with hysteria as a young girl after um, her sister died, her younger sister died, and she was expressing grief, which was uh, diagnosed as hysteria, she, through talking therapy, which was innovative and, and still new at the time, healed, you know, and was deemed cured by the director of the institute because she was institutionalized from her native um, hometown in Rostov, Russia. She was institutionalized then in Zurich. And she was cured through talk therapy, which I believe was because she actually could express herself and had someone to listen to her and, and affirm her. Uh, which was young, and she was actually one of his first female patients. 
So whether or not they had an affair doesn't matter. And I'm not going to talk about it. Okay. What matters is that she took this treatment that she received and made it into a career. She became a student of psychology. She got a PhD. Hmm. She became the first child psychologist. She delved really deeply into children's neuroses, children's dreams, wow. especially after she had her own children. She really wanted to understand children's world and children's brains and their worldview. And so she really did the first systematic study of psychology in children. Huh. She practiced for 30 years as a psychoanalyst. Wow. She was extremely well known, extremely influential, and extremely important to the beginning field of psychoanalysis. Huh. When she was working in Zurich, and she had also been working in Berlin and Geneva and could speak three languages and teach in all three languages, she originated the, the so-called death wish almost a full decade before Freud um, expanded on her idea. And, and he's, you know, he's become known for that. But he right. actually cites her in, in his footnotes, indebted to her. And though he, his concept is much different, she had this beautiful idea and concept of death as a dissolution into one's beloved. So it's just this very poetic, feminine point of view about love and destruction of the self, metaphorically through childbirth, bringing a new being into the world. She called it destruction in the service of creation. And of course, sometimes uh, childbirth led to actual death, and that was in service of this new child. So destruction in, in the service of creation. But aside from that literal translation of it, interpretation, it was this idea of transformation, and especially for women and sexually active imagination um, about dissolution and union through sexuality with one's partner. She was such a pioneer and that so many others have, have really expanded on those topics, but no one has really realized how progressive, how interesting and pioneering those those ideas were at the time and they really came from her she did a lot of research in women's sexuality in what she called the bisexuality of the soul that women are sexual beings at all sort of pushing back hard against the narratives of the time but also the narratives that these two men will carry on after oh, her yeah. wow. about the what women are right how they exist in the world yeah their ideas were very different. He translated it into biology. You know, there's there's such an emphasis on biological gender and male being this and female being that. And she actually right. kind of turned that on its head. And she took it to, to a metaphorical place. She did a lot of work about archetypes and mythology, mm. archaic stories and how they pertain to what we're learning. Oh, Greek wow. Myths. Yeah, I totally associate that with Jung. Exactly. All of these things she started first, huh. and she really laid the groundwork for these as things that could be applied to psychoanalysis. Jung is not erasing her. He's not taking credit for her ideas. That These ideas that he is taking from her, he is citing. Yeah. He is saying, clearly, this is her, yeah. and I'm going to do this with it. Treating her like a peer. Right. From the correspondence between these three, yeah. we can see that she was definitely viewed as an equal and mm -hmm. as someone they looked up to and admired and learned from. Because she was a 19-year-old, quote, hysteric, being seen by Jung, and, and this was a bit of the basis of the formation of Jung and Freud's relationship, Jung was getting advice about Sabina Spielrein. But the kind of salacious nature of did they or didn't they, mm. that is what has taken over, completely overshadowing the fact that she was Jung's patient for about eight months. She then <laughs> lived her life into her 50s, an analyst, a colleague. 
she actually wrote about a lot of pain she experienced because let's not forget, you know, as patient and therapist, there's a breach of ethics if they had been yeah. involved, which I'm not even saying that they were. We need to consider that when we say things about romance. Right. Or that he cured her because of love or some relationships. <laughs> But, but that's the dominating narrative. That's how she's painted in it. And actually, her diaries contradict that. The fact that that gets characterized as a romance, I really think is detrimental and still relevant to women's experiences with abuses of power. Early on, she sent a letter to Freud well before she had like a right to write to Freud. She's nobody, she's this 19-year-old nobody. And she sends a letter to Freud that is really amazing. She actually wrote to him talking about the relationship with Jung and standing up for herself and these, these labels that were already circulating. And he wrote to her, not believing her. Dr. Jung is my friend. I think I know him and have reason to believe that he's incapable of ignoble behavior. So I'd urge you to ask yourself whether your feelings are not best suppressed and eradicated. <laughs> <laughs> it took Jung actually confessing, you know, whatever there was to confess to Freud for him to wow. then write back to Spielrein asking for forgiveness. And she wrote again. Well, that's Something, right, it's something, it's something. But she wrote back again, yeah, you should have given me an audience. <laughs> I think that's one of the most astonishing letters. She's really speaking up for herself, but then that kind of starts their correspondence. There are letters bouncing theories back and forth, which are fascinating. She becomes a, a working colleague with both of these thinkers. Her paper on the death wish was so well received in the community that prominent scholars called it akin to the work of the great mystics. Wow. Freud was so impressed with this paper that he presented her for membership to the Psychoanalytical Society. He and the fellow members of his Vienna Psychoanalytic Society voted unanimously to have her as a member. And she was the first woman to be voted unanimously into the society. So what happened? I mean, how come she didn't get the credit? Did she call it something ah. boring and he branded it something exciting or what? No, I think that's what's so fascinating about this, that even when everyone involved is working in absolute good faith to assure credit where credit is due, mm -hmm. translation will ruin it. And in this case, I mean literal translation. Wow. Jung's works are translated into other languages. The footnotes are not translated. Oh. And so all of these meticulous citations giving her credit for all of these ideas Poof. Wow. Disappear. And so everyone reading these groundbreaking works in England, in France, in America, oh. are not seeing where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. And Sabina Spielrein saw this coming. She was very concerned about it. And we have letters where she is writing to Jung saying, I'm very concerned that people aren't going to know where you're getting this from. I'm very concerned that people are going to leave me out of this and that my ideas are going to become your ideas when people read these. And Jung it. wrote back, yeah, exactly. It's almost like women know what happens <laughs> to women. <laughs> but Jung, it, with seemingly total sincerity, wrote back and said, don't be ridiculous. Everyone knows this is yours. Mm. It, she was so well known, he was almost laughing at the idea. Who would ever think that this was his? It's Sabina Spielrein, huh. obviously. So even though she was so concerned about this and called these problems, it still happened. Hmm. When these works go out into the world, she is removed from them. And these ideas that she pioneered became theirs. I'm a little bit annoyed. Couldn't Freud 
and Jung just have mentioned her in the text instead of yeah. the footnotes. Like, just say, as you Sabina Schreierin right? has established, yeah. blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but it seemed to be just, Maybe they you just know, thought it was a given. Following, yeah, yeah, it's following standard academic citation practice. And also, it really seems to have been something like, like it would yeah, be like now. You're like you're referencing all the single ladies and you're like, come on, everybody knows. Exactly. This is Beyonce. We don't need to attribute this phrase to Beyonce. Everybody right. knows. Right. You know, no one's going to get confused. Yeah. But they did. Hmm. And she was disappeared out of these books. Boo. There's another aspect to her silencing, but we'll get to that in a minute. And now a word from a podcast that I personally love, Latina to Latina. So you obviously like listening to powerful and inspiring stories. So I want to tell you about a show that highlights women who are trailblazers wherever they are. Latina to Latina lets you listen in on intimate conversations with some of the most fascinating Latinas in the USA. From Hollywood power producers to chefs to activists, guests on Latina to Latina are the types of women you have come to admire. Subscribe to Latina to Latina wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey there, I'm Alicia Menendez, host of Latina to Latina, a podcast where I get to talk to powerful and inspiring women. I'm trying to have an exceptional career. Of course it's going to be exceptionally hard. Part of what clicked for me was giving up this idea of needing to save the world. Deciding that, you know what, I don't have to be what other people want me to be. Listen and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And visit latinatolatina.com for more. In our narrative now, Freud and Jung are opposing forces, hmm. right? In Psychology 101. They're friends, but they are two different ways of looking at the world. And you have to pick one. You're a Freudian or you're a Jungian. Yeah. And if we have one woman coming up with all of the ideas for both of them to build on, that really shakes that foundation that we have of pick one. Yeah. If they're both drawing from Sabina Spielrein, they can't be those two pillars of psychology that are so different. They're all doing similar things together in a much messier mm. way than I think most of us in Psychology 101 want to talk about. Uh -huh. And that's the thing, of course, she was influenced by both, and they were also influenced by her. And that seems to be the the problem, that I don't understand why it's a problem if everyone was influenced by everyone. Spielrein really was the best of both worlds, in my opinion. She took this kind of mythic understanding, this very literary base of Jung, and interpreted it as a woman, you know, very clearly writing about women's sexuality. And then she took a more, you know, grounded approach in, in dreams and family trauma from Freud. They're both Spielreinian. That's exactly the term that Angela Sells wants to start oh. bringing into the common discourse. Oh, cool. I love it. I'm using it from now on. You're a Spielreinian? These are Spielreinian ideas. Ah. It, it doesn't quite have the same ring. I will give you that. Yeah. But maybe the two guys became famous because their last names are one simple syllable. <laughs> and hers is hard. That's all it came down yeah. to. <laughs> I honestly would love for that to become a thing because I really think she deserves it. The other issue is, unfortunately, that these men had decades to refine their ideas, to work on publishing, to publicize their own work, mm. to create their own uh -oh. fan clubs no no <laughs> she's gonna die <laughs> she's gonna die uh. <laughs> and and unfortunately in a particularly terrible way no. so everyone prepare yourselves okay because after studying and practicing in switzerland for many years sabina spielrein moves back to russia Huh. In 1923, she decides to travel back to Moscow. Okay, so 1923, that's six years after the Bolshevik Revolution. Right. Okay. So hopefully things have calmed down a little and things are pretty stable. 
She opens a practice specializing in child psychology. She is a teacher. She trains John Piaget. Oh. Hmm. Um, he joins the staff and actually goes through an eight-month analysis with her huh. as his psychoanalyst. In 1925, she leaves Moscow and she and her daughter move with her husband, who much earlier had moved back to a village named Rostov on Don. And in Rostov on Don, she's still continuing to do psychoanalysis. She's also working as a pediatrician. Wow. But. Okay. In 1941. Oh, no. The Germans invade Russia. And Sabina Spielrein is Jewish. <gasps> oh, my gosh. And in 1942, the German army occupies her city. And she and her two daughters are killed by an SS death squad. Oh, my gosh. And not just them, but the entire village, 27,000 people are killed. Oh, my gosh. They massacre everyone in this entire village. Wow. So, aside from, of course, the horrific tragedy Mm -hmm. of that that also means that her legacy ends Mm. she you know we've talked a lot about the importance of having someone to carry on your legacy to tell your story yeah all of her children are dead all of her family members are dead Mm. and so there's no one to carry on her legacy and while Freud and Jung do, they keep praising her work. Yeah, I was just going to ask, why, don't, why aren't they carrying it on? And they are, but those praises keep not being translated. Mm. And, and I think that can't be an accident, that yeah. when you are translating a work, it's not an accident when you eliminate all traces of the woman who came up with these ideas, well, especially a Jewish woman in this time period. Yeah. Well, I suspect that post-World War II, you know, heading into the Cold War, she's Russian. So, you know, Mm -hmm. the Western world would be inclined to just remove all Russian elements from... And since, as we established... Yeah, in that... in uh, I think it was in the Marjorie Hillis episode that we talked about how in the 1950s in western and especially american culture there was this new movement to get women back into the home because oh, yeah. that's the american way and they're building right. all of that they're building the american way on freud and if freud's built his right. ideas on this russian woman who exactly is not just going back into the kitchen <laughs> and most ironically freud got very angry with sabina spielrein when she got pregnant Ah. Because he told her, you're wasting your talents. Wow. You, you're, it would be a waste of your intellect and your gifts for you to just be a mother. Wow. And Sabina Spielrein, of course, said, Psst, I can do both. Right. <laughs> I can do both. Yeah. You're doing both. Jung's doing both. Why can't I do both? Wow. And she did. So she is just in the worst possible scenario because she's Jewish. So she's being erased in Russia all the way through yeah. the war and then and in Europe yeah. throughout throughout the war you know these you can't put a Jewish person on a pedestal during the right. war and then and after then the as war, soon she's as Russian. the war ends <laughs> she's Russian wow huh. so she's just kind of casually erased yeah. in a way that she foresaw but that these men just genuinely couldn't see When the reputations of, of you know, Jung and Freud became the pillars, so-called, of psychology, then, you know, 1970s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, that's when we see scholars really fight to stigmatize any inkling of Spielrein. Part of the problem might be that she has been stuck in psychology. Huh. Jung and Freud have been freed from psychology. Now you study Jung and Freud 
everywhere. We yeah. studied them in literature analysis. We studied them in history. We studied them in philosophy. We studied them in art history. We study them everywhere. Yeah. They are by no way limited to the idea that they are psychologists. Right. right? Yeah. And she is still stuck in psychology. Freud actually wanted her to replace Jung's name on the masthead of his journal. These are the, the facts, you know, of her later adult life. And so I have a theory that the relationship or the kind of sexual intrigue of her relationship with Jung as his patient subsumes or kind of consumes us because it keeps her as this sick little girl instead of, mm. you know, the healthy career woman. <laughs> The culture continues to be obsessed with the story of Sabina Spielrein as the 19-year-old hysteric in therapy with Jung and the mistress having an affair with Jung. Mm. Even though she has a 30-year career. Yeah. That's less than one year of her life. Yeah. But that is the story that we keep talking about. And Angela Sells will point out, even articles and books written less than 10 years ago, they are still calling her the ingenue patient, the devotee mm. worshipped at the altar of Jung. Yeah. <laughs> when he saw her as a colleague, when she created these really important ideas, yeah. and maybe that's because if we can keep her as the 19-year-old patient who has psychology done at her, mm -hmm. instead of doing psychology... We can justify dismissing her. Yeah. We can we can keep our simple Keep boxes. our nice, uncomplicated... Exactly, yeah. our nice, uncomplicated Jung and Freud. Yeah. And they created psychology. Yeah. Psychoanalytic innovation isn't pie. If we give her some, there's not less for Freud and Jung. <laughs> you would be amazed what scholars and reputable scholars have said, you know, as recently as 2010, it was really the later papers dismissing her that were the most horrifying. I mean, I, I compiled this list of names that she was called in scholarly journals, you know, hysterical, schizo, little girl lost, borderline schizoid, obsessive seductress, Asian provocateur an Aryan worshipper because she was Jewish, Jung was Christian. Oh. I mean, horrifying, but accepted into the narrative. And that the funny thing is, though, is that it was there all along. We have diaries and letters. We don't need to rewrite anything. We have right. first-hand accounts. <laughs> I think that there's a lot of fear. If we elevate a woman, does that mean that then these men who were influenced by her and vice versa somehow lose mm. their status. And it just, to me, that's the wrong conversation. It doesn't have to mean anyone, you know, has to change their opinions about anybody involved or we have to, right. we have to tarnish anyone's reputation. It really just means that there should be room for her alongside these people. A lot of this reminds me of Alma Mahler, the yeah. same way that she is repeatedly erased yeah. and repeatedly prevented from being even being own. included in the yeah. conversation. Reduced to a mistress. Yeah, exactly. Reduced to the mistress and the mad mistress, mm -hmm. right? She is the right. hysterical, yeah. that, that he unreliable, yeah. That, yeah, and he, through the power of love, mm -hmm. again, ew, <laughs> um, <laughs> fixes this. And even the importance of that narrative, that hysteria can be solved in less than a year by a gifted psychiatrist. Yes. By a loving man. A loving man and and some talk therapy, when really this clearly seemed to have just been grief. Yeah. And so all of these narratives are shaken up when we start to, to undo that, that Jung could, he was the master therapist who could fix people immediately, that severe mental illness is fixable with just a few simple new tricks. Yeah. We don't want all of that to be broken. I was a bit too hopeful, I'll admit, <laughs> pre-publication, because after publication, my argument was actually trying to focus on her as, as a historical person, focus on her work. 
But the dominating narrative became, again, what was the relationship exactly with Jung? Let's really talk about her sexuality. And so I feel right. like that completely overshadowed her work yet again. Mm. And so I actually was very sad too after publication because I thought that, you know, almost a hundred years later, here we are again with this love triangle narrative that has nothing to do mm. with her work and what it what it still could mean because there are some of her ideas that I feel are still so relevant to especially women today. I almost wish <laughs> that her work could be republished in philosophy because she's so based in Nietzsche and, and there's not a lot of the kind of practical hands-on Nietzsche that you know then develop. I wonder if that's almost harming her ability to get out of, of purely psychology because when right. you read her stuff, I mean, jargon aside, some of it is just so beautiful and she herself wanted to be a philosopher and, and she, coming from this Jewish rabbinical family, was more in line with that kind of right. mystical outlook and so... I feel like the way that Freud and Jung have been, you know, repackaged for the humanities, I think that she could really benefit from something like that too. If we can move her into broader fields, maybe some of that pushback, some of that threat will be removed and we can start really looking at this still really fascinating, groundbreaking, critical work she was doing around archetypes, around narrative as a force in society and in our own minds in the development of our psyches. Some of these takes on Greek myths that she is coming up with, I have never heard anyone talk about. And they've been sitting there this whole time. This seems to be the moment for that. Have you have you read the new translation of the Odyssey? Yes, I just bought it in Greece. And I also bought Stephen Fry's new Mythos, which is a retelling of all the Ooh. Greek myths. I think Emily Wilson's translation of the Odyssey is one of the best examples of why this kind of thing is important. That, again, speaking of translation, yeah. that in this translation of a story that we all think we know, she uncovers so many of the ways that stuff that had no business being in there mm -hmm. have been inserted. Mm -hmm. That these sexist agendas, the who are the sirens? We all know what sirens look like. We all know that they're sexy and dangerous and alluring and you know, beguile men with their beauty. Mm -hmm. And that's nowhere. That's nowhere in the Odyssey. That was imposed by sexist men translating the Odyssey yeah. in the 19th century. Yeah. And so much of the things that we think are the lessons of Greek myths are nonsense. Hey, it's the same old theme. <laughs> we retell <laughs> the same stories over and over to suit the present day. Yeah. We pick new main characters. We shift people around and put different people in the spotlights. The number one bestseller in historical novels this week, I was just looking, is a retelling of the myth of Circe. Oh, yeah. With Circe as the main yep. character. Yep. Yeah, I think now is the moment for us to do that with Sabina Spielrein. Let's rediscover her. Let's yeah dig in and find all of these old new ideas that she has been sharing with us for half a century mm. and none of us have heard. Awesome. Huge thanks to Dr. Angela Sells if you'd like to learn more about Sabina Spielrein, you can find pictures, links to books and other information, and lots more at our website, whatshernamepodcast.com. Thanks also to this episode's sponsors, Chantel Oliver and Catherine McKay. If you'd like to become a supporter of the podcast, just click on the donate link on our website and find great rewards like trading cards, cross-stitch patterns, and more. No donation is too small. You can become a patron for only a dollar a month, and every bit helps us create more women's history. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where we post lots of photos each week. Music for this episode was provided by Tria Logo, Nico DiNapoli, Michael Levy, and Amanda Setlick-Wilson. 
Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith. What's Her Name is produced by Olivia Mickle and Katie Nelson, and this episode was edited by Olivia Mickle.